thank you so much for being here. I hope you've got your cup of tea or coffee or beer or whatever it is. We're going to cover some really cool topics, no pun intended, because it's snowing outside. We're going to learn, for one thing, um, some new science, some new science and research about rhubarb. And that's why I'm wearing these colors. They're not normally my colors, pink and orange, but we're going to celebrate rhubarb. I want to start with something that I just found. It's um, a quote about gardening. And I co-authored the New York Times bestseller, Chicken Soup for the Gardener's Soul. And one of my jobs was to find quotes to go with every single story. I forgot about this one. So this was just perfect. It's by Dan Barker. And he says, people are always asking, what is the purpose of life? That's easy. Relieve suffering, create beauty, make gardens. So with that, let's dive in. And get ready to take uh, screenshots because even though I will have this up on my Gardener's Coach a YouTube channel here, you might want to take some screenshots because I'm going to share recipes and stuff like that. So. so rhubarb, please, is more than a pie plant. It's known as a pie plant. Rhubarb is the Rodney Dangerfield of vegetables. It gets no respect. So here are some things we're going to cover about rhubarb. And by the way, um, rhubarb is just barely coming up in our garden. A little knuckle just poking up, but it's happening. So I've got faith. So let's start with growing and dividing rhubarb. Some people say, oh, Marion, they're getting all skinny and thin. My stalks are getting really woody and fibrous and I'm not really getting much. And what I would say is it's time to split them. Now, rhubarb is a very forgiving vegetable. You can throw just about anything at it. Now, when I say you can throw just about anything at it, I'm talking about in the way of mulch with leaf mold and kelp and compost, unfinished compost, which is really important to make that differentiation because finished compost is okay, perfect to use just about anywhere, including seed starting mixes, but unfinished compost, say, is not because it can actually... Um, um, prevent a plant from growing. It might create um, seeds from not germinating, like a problem there. It can be too hot, but rhubarb, it'll take anything. And it also means, um, you know, pine needles and spruce needles. And like I said, just about anything. Last year, I had an abundance of well, it's my favorite blend to add to a compost pile. It's when you mow the lawn and you pick up the grass clippings and the leaves at the same time. I mulched probably three inches on top of the rhubarb, and I'm really glad I did because we're having a very, very cold spring. So getting back to dividing your rhubarb, important thing to realize about rhubarb, it really needs water. So if you're going to plant a new clump of rhubarb, Put it in a place where maybe it has partial shade or a lot of shade if you live in a warm climate. Speaking of warm climates, I used to have people contact me, or just text me from Texas. They said, hey, Marion, I want to grow rhubarb. I'll trade you with some grapefruit. So can't do it. So what you want to do is if your rhubarb stalks are getting pretty woody and they're just not producing like they used to, then it's time to divide them. And you wanna do that before the stalks get too tall. And here you can see that the stalks are just starting to emerge. They're still crumpling and they haven't even opened up yet. So if your rhubarb is say stalks are mm, six inches tall, it's getting a little marginal. If you do have to divide it, if your friend has bribed you with, you know, like a million dollars, hey, I want some rhubarb, um, then go ahead and divide it. But just keep in mind that you don't want to um, you don't want to harvest this year or that first year from your clumps. So you're going to divide the rhubarb with a shovel just right down the middle. It doesn't sound very pretty, but that's what you have to do. And then you want to separate it about two or three feet apart. 
keep it well watered and mulched and harvest minimally or maybe not at all. So that's what you want to do is right down the middle, divide them out two or three feet and keep them well watered. Okay. Now there is also some people wonder about, well, if the, if the flower shoot pops up, should I pinch it off or not? I've done an experiment either way and it didn't seem to make any difference. Actually, I think the flower stalks are kind of pretty myself. Normally, if a plant is flowering, it's telling us that it's done with a cycle. Um, if it's rhubarb, it might just be saying that maybe I'm a little stressed too. And it might be that the plant is getting older and it's just a natural thing to happen. Rhubarb is being accepted as a landscape plant. So certain stalks showing up about three or four feet with this beautiful, you know, creamy white blossoms on top. I think it's kind of pretty. So as far as nutrition goes, we kind of know this part. High fiber, it's a, it's a mild laxative. Uh, it contains vitamin C, potassium, calcium, and so on. We know all that. But what about cooking? Rhubarb is known, of course, for the pie plant. But you can also make fruit leather, sauces, and I'm talking about sauces that are both savory and sweet. I've made rhubarb sauces that go on halibut, for example, or chicken. It's great. And how about pickles? What the heck? Yep. Rhubarb pickles. This is something I started playing with years ago because, frankly, I was kind of tired of the rhubarb pie and um, deep dish fruit rhubarb things. So I tried different pickle recipes for rhubarb, and this is the one that I found to be the most, the easiest to do. It's a refrigerator pickle, and you can use it a million ways. So here's one of those cases where you might want to take a screenshot of this. I am going to produce um, another video for my YouTube channel, The Gardener's Coach, and just cover this making rhubarb pickles and other strange things to do with rhubarb. So here you go. The rhubarb pickles, it's a, like a sweet and sour kind of um, refrigerator pickle. You want to make sure you're using a non-aluminum pan. Um, go to the bottom here. You can see how to eat pickled rhubarb. It's amazing. You can add it to coleslaws, fruit salads. Um, you can toss it with, you know, like greens too. Add it to soups at the very end for that perking up. You know, I, I often will put a half a lemon in a soup, but sometimes just putting in the rhubarb is just that little tang also. Um, baked potatoes, I add them to steamed yams or sweet potatoes, even tuna salad. You can put them in sandwiches and... What, another thing we do here in Alaska is we catch a lot of salmon. And if you, if you clean out the gut cavity and you want to bake it whole, say grill it or bake it, you just stuff the cavity with a blend of vegetables, even onions and pickled rhubarb. It's awesome. And then when you're all done with the pickles, save that juice and use it for making salad dressings. It's a lovely pink. You can see this here. And it's a great salad dressing base. All right, now I wanna talk about some discoveries that have come up in the past couple years regarding rhubarb. And let's take a look at those. For one thing, rhubarb has potential for treating Alzheimer's. And this was in the journal Aging. Here's the next one, is rhubarb's potential use in treating skin disorders. So um, this was, Something I wish I knew as a teenager about acne, and um, I, I would have given my left arm to know about this, but um, in this international journal, they found that rhubarb again help improve skin conditions like acne. So, hey, got nothing to lose, except <laughs> I was pretty darn shy as a kid. All right. A natural insecticide. Now, this piqued my interest because I don't want to use chemicals. So let's take a look. Rhubarb 
extract, again, has insecticidal properties. Now, this is a natural alternative to chemicals, like I said, pesticides and so on. So they have compounds called, here we go, anthroquinones. How did I do? Anthroquinones. It's too long for Scrabble, but the point is that this compound is toxic to insects and can be used to control particularly aphids and spider mites, but aphids in particular because um, aphids are a soft-bodied insect, and so um, it probably would like get to them right away. Speaking of aphids, um, I did an experiment this year because I grow my own onions, and I have to be very, very careful that after I clip off the top of the onion and they're, they're drying in the garage before I store them, I have to watch them very, very carefully because it's pretty common for aphids to show up and they're all kind of inside the papers, but they don't really show themselves right away. So um, one thing I did was I looked at them. I said, oh, no, I've got aphids showing up. I can't bring them in the house. They're going to get all over the plants. So I took the little the, the onion that had the little tip coming out as it was kind of drying and the aphids are right there. They're gray little guys. And I actually soaked them in white vinegar for a couple of days. The whole onion, right? Aphids and all. What do you think happened? Well, at first, no aphids. They weren't moving. But I took my special 10x loop and I looked at them and I went, oh no, they're still alive. So aphids are pretty, pretty industrious, right? Okay, where are we? Got that. Okay. So here is how you make a natural insecticide with rhubarb. It's pr it's pretty basic, right? You can imagine you're going to you're going to chop up some fresh rhubarb, put it in a pot, add a bunch of water, and you bring it to a boil. And you just reduce the heat, and let it simmer for, you know, 30 minutes, an hour. You know, you can always just let it simmer and then just turn off the heat, put the lid on and then just go do errands or go weed in your garden or something. Cool it down to kind of room temp, then it's just easier to work with. Number four is you want to strain the liquid. And what I do, I do it in stages because I don't want to clog up my spray bottle. So I run it through like a, a sieve and then maybe cheesecloth to get more of the chunks. And then I actually run it through a coffee filter. And that seems to do the final trick. And then number five is you add about a tablespoon of, of Dr. Bronner's or some other liquid soap, not dish soap like Joy or anything like that. That's too toxic. And then you spray it um, to your plants or on your plants. If you're dealing with aphids, you want to make sure you're spraying uh, under the leaves and all over the plant. But always run a test first. Always run a test first wait a day or so and just see how the plant reacts, how the leaves are doing, okay? So that's kind of a nice, besides it's going to be a really pretty paint color, right? I'm going to um, update my video that I've got on uh, do-it-yourself natural pest control. So watch for that as well. well. Thank you so much for being with me today. And it's still snowing. And Next time we talk next week, I hope that'll stop. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a great rest of your weekend and your week, and we'll see you in the garden. Cheers.